friends, my dear friends, residents, all in Bukit Timah, Bukit Panjang. It is a very special moment for me to stand here before you in this field, to see so many of you here, to also see my father, my wife in the audience. Just now, Mr. Liang Eng Hua said that he was educated in Bukit Panjang English School. 57 years ago, my father and my mother were teachers in Bukit Panjang School. That's where they met, and as a result, I'm here. And the school has shifted a bit, but the actual site is 10 Mile Junction, where the LRT is. Every time I drive past there, I'm reminded that this place is special. But let me, if you don't mind, share a story which I've shared before in Parliament, but I think many of you may not have heard it, and I want to repeat it again today. Because I want you to look into my heart and understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. My mother's father, my grandfather, passed away when he was on a business trip in China. I think this was about 82, 83 years ago, just before my mother was born. That left my grandmother, a young widow with two children and one more, my mom. Life was very tough. She, was, she had no work. The family business was run by other relatives and she had to depend on handouts and an allowance from relatives and friends. My mother grew up deprived, very, very skinny. She had TB and when she met my father, she told him that she would probably be infertile because she was so mal malnourished. We know, of course, she was wrong because she ended up with five children. <laughs> but that childhood poverty made a deep impact on her life. She only lived for 70 years, but she could never spend money. She could never waste money. She was always counting. There's no small change, you know, counting every bit. And not for herself, but for her children and her family. And she also drilled into us some lessons in life. What are these lessons? One, that life is unpredictable. Bad things can happen to good people and you don't know when it can happen. And two, when things like that happen, you have to depend on your relatives, your, your closest friends, because you only know who is really reliable when something bad happens. The third thing she taught me was always be prepared. Always have savings, Always be sure, clear that when something goes wrong, you have another plan. And the fourth lesson she taught me was that you have to work hard. Because it is only through hard work, through education, through getting a career that you can make progress and you can provide for your family. I tell you all these things because this is why I am in politics. This is why I make the decisions I make and the policies which I rolled out in MCYS. My friends, this election is not an easy election. I think you all know me now. I'm a very, very honest minister. 
This is not an easy election. Why is it not an easy election? I think there is one key question the voters of Singapore are asking us. That question is, do you care? Do you care about me? It's not a matter of how smart you are. It's not a matter of how detailed your plans are, but your heart. And for those of us standing as candidates of the PAP, we need to remind ourselves and remind the voters of Singapore that we care for you and we will look after you. And everything that we do, sometimes tough, sometimes unpopular, is because we care for you. The last few weeks, I have not been making many speeches because my teammates, including Dr. Teo, my new colleague, Ms. Sim Ann, have been meeting thousands of people. And I say thousands because we've been making house visit after house visit after house visit, market visits, meeting people. When we meet these people, I don't give them a long talk, a long speech. I ask them one question. What are you concerned with? What are you afraid of? What is your hopes? What is your fear? And for this election, people have told me a few things. Almost everyone I meet is concerned about the cost of living. Almost everyone I meet is concerned about jobs. Almost everyone I meet is concerned about the cost of homes. And almost everyone I meet is concerned about their children. So let's just tonight, without any big fiery speeches, just consider these four points. The cost of living, our jobs, our homes, and our children. First thing I want to tell you is that the government, the PAP, and the people are on the same side. The opposition wants you to believe that we are creating the problems for you, that we are making things worse for you. That is not true. Let me, let's deal with the first issue, the cost of living. Everything we eat, we drink, we use, even the clothes that we wear, where do we get it from? Where is it from? It's overseas, right? Do we determine the prices that the overseas countries charge us for our food, for oil, for our clothes, for all the things that we use in our daily life? We don't, you know. This is just Singapore, 3.2 million citizens, we cannot control global prices. If there's instability in the Middle East, oil prices rise. If you get a drought or a flood in agricultural countries, food prices rise. If there's a harvest failure for cotton, even clothing prices will rise. So understand, this is not something that the PAP has done to our people, but something that happens as a result of worldwide developments. But the PAP, the government, has to do something about it. So what do we do to help you cope with the cost of living? Yesterday, the Prime Minister said, the most effective long-term solution to dealing with rising costs is to raise your salaries. But to raise your salaries by making sure you have better jobs with higher productivity, which justify in a competitive globalized world that higher salary. You know, my friends, never before in history have 
2.3 billion people in the world suddenly become connected to a global economy. I'm talking, of course, about India and China. Never before in history has computers and new ways of making things suddenly made human manual labor so cheap. So let's understand that there are deep fundamental global forces at play and it is not a political conspiracy to make life tough for Singaporeans. But how do we help you? We said productivity. We are going to spend, I think, $2.6 billion further on education, on training, so that all of us can get better jobs. But this is a long-term solution, and politics is an election every five years. So you can have a long-term solution, but you also need to have other immediate solutions. One other short-term response to rising prices is our exchange rate. You all know the Singapore dollar has been rising over the last one year plus. Any of, I know many of you here have gone on overseas travels. You know that your Singapore dollar, now you take it out, can buy more ringgit, more US dollars, more pounds, more of almost any other currency. This is one way of reducing the impact of inflation. But let me tell you this. If our opposition wins. And what do they want to do? They have told you. They want to spend the money. And when they spend the money and they reduce the reserves, I ask you, what will happen to your value of your Singapore dollar? Will it go up or will it go down? Down. And when it goes down, what will happen to the cost of living? Will that go up or go down? It will go up. Is that a better situation or a worse situation? It will be worse. And that is obvious. Having said that, we also need to understand that even in a globalized world, even with a strong government, even with a strong Singapore dollar, there will be people who need help. I'm talking, of course, of people who are older, people who have less education, people who have been retrenched, or people whose jobs are not very secure. So what must we do to help these people? Can we ignore them? No. But what can we do for them? You look at this recent budget. Many people in you know, the opposition say, oh no, this just is election, you know, trying to buy votes. It's not. We have Comcare, we have Workfare, we have the Grow and Share package, we have CPF, MediSafe top-ups, we have GST rebates. All these are big transfers of money from the government to the people who have less. Why do we do this? We do this because the people need it. And we do this because we care. And that's the point we need to understand. This is a caring government. You know, I've been the minister for MCYS now for seven years. Many people have accused me of being stingy. But let's look at the actual figures. It is true. In the last seven years, the budget for MCYS has increased tremendously. In fact, the last budget that was just passed, I think MCYS budget is something like $1.9 billion. $1.9 billion. How do I spend this $1.9 billion? Let me explain to you. The biggest item that I spend on in MCYS is on families. So I spend something like seven or eight hundred million dollars on things like your baby bonus, childcare subsidies, subsidies for kindergartens, KIFAS, CFAC, and many other things. 
seven or eight hundred million dollars to help look after your family, especially if you're a low income family, so that a family who was caught like my grandmother's family, suddenly with the loss of a sole breadwinner, would be able to have a home, would be able to put food on the table, would be able to send the children to school, would be able to have medical care, and would not be deprived of an opportunity to succeed in the future. So that's on families. Then the opposition have accused me of being stingy with helping people who are less well off. And even that, they have got their figures wrong. MCYS operates a social safety net, which we call many helping hands. That means the voluntary welfare organizations, the grassroots organizations, people like you who want to help, government will also put matching money. Together, your dollar plus the government's dollar becomes two dollars. That two dollars becomes more effective in helping people in need. And how much money, I ask you, flows to families who are in need in Singapore? Do you know the number? I think you all will not know the number. Every year now, almost half a billion dollars, 500 million dollars, flows to people who have lower income, who are disadvantaged, or who need our social assistance. So this is not a stingy government. People say, oh, you know, your, your public assistance rate is only $400. Well, I remind you that when I first became the minister for MCYS, it was only $260. I have increased it steadily to $400. But even $400 is only the cash allowance. If you actually ask a person who is on public assistance in Singapore, and you compare this person with someone in America or UK or anywhere else in the world, I can stand here confidently and tell you the Singaporean is better off. And let me explain why, even if you don't want to take it at face value. If you're a single person living alone, it's 400. If you are a family with two children, we will give you $1,350 cash. Your children's education, free. Medical care, free. Rental housing, very, very low rate. All the money that you have, you can use it for food, you can use it for clothes. Even if you have difficulty cooking the food, we will then have schemes to prepare, cook food, and deliver it to you. And that's why I need to remind all of you that we do care for our people, that we do look after our people, and we will make sure that no matter what happens to you, between the government, the grassroots organizations, the community support, we will look after you, look after your parents, look after your children. So that's the first point. Cost of living, and remember, government is doing its best to help. The second concern that Singaporeans have told me on my walkabouts is jobs. And this is a very, very real concern. You know, in the last 10 years that I've been in politics, in 1998, before I came in, we had the Asian financial crisis. Sep 01, we had the dot-com bust, and then we had September 11. Today, we know Osama bin Laden has finally been executed. In 03, we had SARS. In 2008, 2009, we had the global financial crisis, the biggest financial crisis that has hit us, all of us here, in our lifetime. Right? Yet, we seem to have recovered each time we bounced up. And we bounced up so fast that sometimes I worry that we don't appreciate the fact that the ability to bounce up after such a major crisis is amazing. You know? Because even today, here as we talk, 
do you know what the unemployment rate in America is? It's about nearly 10%. The unemployment rate in Europe is also nearly 10%. What is the unemployment rate in Singapore? Do you all know? 1.9%. That is equivalent... Okay. That is one of the lowest rates of unemployment anywhere in the world. And to be able to achieve that, despite all the external shocks that we have gone through, my friends, don't take this for granted. This is something special. This is something precious. But this success is not because only of the PAP, but it is because our people of Singapore have learned lessons that my mother taught me. Work hard. Take any job. Save. Look after your children. Now, the opposition says we can do away with manufacturing. Half a million jobs they are prepared to put at risk. The opposition then says, you know, many of you, your pay is not enough. Let's have a minimum wage. Overnight, magic, we raise your pay. But my friends, first let me say, I agree with the intention to raise people's wages. People should have higher pay. The question is, how do you raise people's wages? The opposition way, with a minimum wage, will cause higher unemployment. Why? It's very simple. If you raise wages overnight and it is not competitive, the company will close. When a company closes, there's no more job. Secondly, if you just raise the wage instead of improving the capability and training and education of the worker, you're just fooling yourself. Sooner or later, the company will find a reason to retrench that worker. Third, a minimum wage does not help people who are self-employed. And even if I ask you now tonight, all of you here, many of you are self-employed. A minimum wage will not help people who are self-employed. So what is the PAP solution? We call it workfare, which means we top up your salary so that you have a decent wage, enough to save, enough to look after your family, enough to have a decent life in Singapore. So the point I'm trying to tell you is beware of people who sell you koyok that only apparently makes the pain go away, but actually doesn't cure you. So, jobs are important, and the reason we have to fight this is that if our opposition takes over, between spending money to ship our jobs to Malaysia and Indonesia, pretending to have a minimum wage and raising unemployment, they are going to put our jobs at risk. So please don't do that. Yesterday we celebrated May Day, we celebrated the special relationship between the unions and the PAP. Today, my opposition says, oh, no, 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 bad idea. Unions and PAP have conflict of interest. Keep them apart. But my friends, the reason why we have nearly 7,000 multinational corporations in Singapore is they know that in Singapore, the workers are hardworking, the workers will have a fair deal, the unions will protect the workers and that the unions work with the government to grow more jobs. So again, be very, very careful. You know, when people come up to you and say, it's very easy. Split the PAP, split the NTUC, suddenly workers' pay will go up. It will not happen. You will lose jobs and our livelihood will be at risk. Let me deal with the third concern that you all have shared with me cost of homes. Now, every single 
homeowner in Holland Bukit Timah and Bukit Panjang. In the last five years, I know you have seen appreciation of your values. Am I right? Have your flats gone up? Yes. Okay. Now, you can be happy about that, but I have also met some of you who say, but I worry about my children. Yes, my flat has gone up, but can my child afford a flat? Well, here I want to tell you, look at this field. Look around here at this empty field. The Ministry of National Development has said, and my good friend Mr. Ma Bauta has said, this year they're going to launch 22,000 new build-to-order flats. That's not all. 4,000 design, build, and sell flats. And that's not all. Another 4,000 executive condos. And these, all together, that's 30,000 new public housing flats. In addition to that, there are many more unsold private apartments coming into the market over the next two to three years. So my message to all of you is please don't worry. Mr. Ma will make sure that there are enough flats and he will also help your children to buy their first flat using their CPF and to make sure that they become like you, owners with a stake in Singapore and a stake that will gradually rise. But having said that, let me also add a note of caution. You must understand, why are our prices of our apartments so high right now? There are a few reasons. Let me share a couple of reasons with you. First, it's because people have confidence in Singapore. If you have no confidence in Singapore, you will not be prepared to invest several hundred thousand dollars in a flat. Secondly, and perhaps just as important, supposing we took the opposition's view, we should shut the doors and the borders, no more immigration. Let me just tell you what will happen. You shut our, we shut our doors today, by the year 2030, our population will shrink because we're not having enough babies. When populations shrink, let me ask you, what do you think will happen to the value of your flats? Will it go up or will it go down? It will go down. So again, let us be very, very careful about quick populist solutions which can actually do long-term harm. Another reason why our house prices are very strong right now is because our interest rates are very low. You can go to DBS and I think you can get a housing loan probably now at 1.2, 1.3%. But my friends, when I bought my first, or when my father bought the house, I remember him paying an interest rate of 14%. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen now. But the message is, do not take what we have now for granted. We now have a strong, booming economy. We have a growing population. We have a confident international investors in Singapore. But so easily, this can go wrong, you know. And when it goes wrong, you are at risk. So let me just end by saying we must be concerned about the future, about our children's future. And we must remember to teach them the right lessons. And even as we fight this political battle, do not get taken in by populist measures which do long-term harm to our children. So, you know, over the last few days in this campaign, it has been tough, it's been hard work. 
But I'll tell you why I'm going to keep fighting all the way to the end, no matter what happens. Because we need to protect our homes, our jobs, our children for the future. Can you think of anything more important to you? Your children, your homes, your jobs. I promise all of you, vote for the PAP. We will protect your children, your homes, your jobs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Undila PAP.